Hey Pickleballers, and welcome to another episode of the Pickle Bros Podcast. As always, thank you for your likes, comments, subscriptions, and use code PICKLEBROS at checkout with Carbon for 10% off. Today, we will be talking about court positioning and off-ball movement. High-level conversation, it's definitely 4-5+, plus, but please tune in. There's a lot of insights that we will be delivering. But before we get started, today is arguably the single most important day in Pickle Bros uh, history. And all of a sudden here, my presentation is not working. <laughs> there we go. Share the screen. Jesse, would you please pull this up? <coughs> it is our man, Jesse's <laughs> birthday. He is 54 years young. He is the man. This is him pictured with Mike Lee. He is the myth. Wow. Oh, these are some great yes. pictures. Uh, that hair, at, though. That oh, my hair. gosh. Look at that. Look All at that the cow. hair on top. Does that say Berkeley? Oh, yes. College on the left, high school on the right. Look, just just look at those skinny muscles. That's, that's a runner's build right there. So he is a myth and... He is a legend. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite activity there. <laughs> so happy birthday, Jesse. We are so excited, man, to uh, be doing the podcast on your birthday. Happy Thank birthday, bro. Happy Thank birthday, you. Jess. That's awesome. Thank you, you guys. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I had your wife send me those pictures, and <laughs> the ones of you with hair is cracking me up. We're, oh, it's so good. So on you do to, look you look fast in those pictures. Like just actually, the picture, yes. just, doesn't he look fast? It's not you, even a clear picture because he's he's just a blur. <laughs> yeah. I outran the camera. That's right. Oh man. That's so great, you guys. All right. On to beef or no beef. Jesse, as it's your birthday, I'll give it over to you. You got oh. a beef or no beef today? I, I do have a beef. Um I've noticed that some of the people I play against uh will often stop multiple times during a game to tie their shoe and I'm just not really processing why it's so difficult for them to tie their shoe properly I mean that's a skill that most of us learned when we were about four years old uh, do they need like velcro shoes or something uh, is that that's it that's your beef that's I love that beef. dude I, I, as a perpetual shoe tire I'll tell you what's going on <laughs> So some of us that move around on the court, our, our shoes get loose. So like we talk about like off ball movement and, you know, moving around so that your feet actually loosen up your shoelaces. So even if they're not untied, it feels a little off and loose. So we kind of readjust. But I do love that you have problems with people tying your shoes. And I'm wondering if that's a personal attack. And I hope it is because <laughs> it feels like I've got one of those clip slider laces, you know, that have the stretchy laces. So I don't have to, I do it once in the morning and I'm done. Well, that's because you don't know how to tie shoes yet. So, <laughs> Hey, you weren't supposed to say that for everyone here. Okay. In all honesty though, like I don't understand why Velcro went away. Is it because it was too unsophisticated? <laughs> it's like, no, no, no. We need to learn how to tie our shoes. You know, we're human beings. We need to like develop our brains and tie our shoes. What the heck is wrong with Velcro? It's not strong enough. I feel like if you plant and turn too hard, your shoes will be left wherever you last stood. That's awesome. That's awesome. So today I have a beef, and that is with people who drill with earbuds in their ears and i have a very specific reason why um and i understand drilling is is tough it's isolating you know it, it is a difficult thing to do especially we play in the morning so we see uh, people drilling in the morning that's when we drill in the morning so i can understand wanting to throw some earbuds in your ears to kind of to get you through the session but if you really consider it there are so many auditory cues that you get in the game of pickleball. You can hear your sweet spot. You can hear where your opponents are hitting the ball, whether they're getting clean contact or not. Um, the sound, the pace, how much energy will be on the ball, even slicing it sounds differently. I And, and maybe not a, everyone uses visual and auditory cues when they're playing the game 
to know what kind of ball is coming at them, but I certainly do. And I think a massive component of that is when you are drilling and you don't get a clean hit, or maybe you do get a clean hit, clean hit, you have to know what that sounds like. You have to hear it. You have to be able to feel it. Even when you've got those earbuds sending the vibrations in your inner ear, it'll, me- it'll distort the ball on your paddle, the vibrations, and it won't feel right. You can't have that extra sensory stuff coming in. And I think you really need to hone in on the paddle, the vibrations, the sound, the feeling and everything. And earbuds will be the single most thing to greatly distort that. If you need music during drilling, get one of those little portable boom boxes, right? Put it off the court perhaps, but just don't stick something in your ears, in your head. It will, it will negate to a great effect all that hard work that you were doing right there and then. Yeah, but if you if you put the the boom box there, then you're just going to create another beef for for Tim and others. Who, you know, cause <laughs> Which is sharing. great, because I, I can never run out of beefs. It's, it's <laughs> Excellent. Well, well, let me ask you this, Ian. Mm. Suppose you have a choice between you can drill one hour with without earbuds or you can drill two hours with them because it's much easier to drill them with. Without, no chance. I think... I mean, obviously, I'm making up a number at this point, but you're going to get less than 25% of the benefit because I think it is not just about, like, it's not about swinging it properly. It's all about the contact point, your grip, where you're hitting the ball. That's what you are actually drilling. You're drilling, drilling the pressure. You're drilling the impact site of the ball on your paddle. And we can all just swing our arm all day long. But if you... I mean, even if you're using a ball machine, which is what most people do in the scenario I'm discussing, you got to hear that ball coming in, right? Hear it whistling through the air. Hear the spin. Hear the machine deploy it. There's just so much going on. I don't. I, I think it is folds more important to to be cued in to everything that is going on. Yeah. That's a really interesting take. Awesome. All right, Stolp, beef. Or no beef. No beef. No beef. You know, sitting here on the day of Jesse's birth uh, from 54 years ago and looking across this screen and having men in their 30s, some in our early 30s, some in our later 30s, some in our 40s, and some in our 50s. I look around our group. I look around our play sessions. I look around our pickleball community. Pickleball is intergenerational, if that is the right word. It's generational. I don't think there's too many activities in this world that allows uh, men and women of all ages to come together from one collective bond and have so much in common so quick. I look at my group of friends here in Colorado Springs, and it's across it's across decades, it's age decades. And I think it's so important for people in their life to have friends who are younger and older than them. But where are you going to find those people? How are you going to find those people? I get so much wisdom inside and outside of pickleball from from this group of, of, of folks I just mentioned. Um, and it's all because of the great sport of pickleball that brought us all together. Um, and so I'm just so grateful with no beef today to be thankful for the sport of pickleball and how it brings all ages of people together so that you can have friend groups above your age and below your age. I think that's wildly important. I think it's missing in, in a lot of aspects of in uh, many people's lives. And so I just encourage people to go out and build that community. Um, and, and knowing that, I mean, I, I know that I have that. I'm so grateful for it. So that's my no beef today. I freaking love that, dude. And and you're totally right. We do span decades. When you think about our core group, you go from our newest, uh, uh, Addy, Adam, who I believe is 24, all the way up to Jim Peterson, who's 72, I believe? 70. 70. That is a massive span. And we have people riddled all throughout that spectrum. It, it really is something unique. You, you totally nailed it. Tim. Beef or no beef? Uh, beef. Um, and Stolps plays right into mine, actually. Stolps non-beef plays right into my beef. Uh, <laughs> speaking of generations, if you're going to line up all the generations that are represented in our 
ecosystem. The one at the end on the opposite side of Jesse's <laughs> is uh, very slow to communicate via text. Um, here we are trying to plan a, a practice session for tomorrow morning where we're trying to have uh, representatives of all the teams that are going to be playing in our November 18th team event so we can get some real dedicated practice in and some matchups. And here we are at the 11th hour and I cannot hear back from one of these individuals and I'm calling them out right now because I have the power of the platform. Um, we would love to just, you know, hear back from you, buddy. <laughs> this happens a lot. Um, I don't know what it is. Like um, these younger guys have the reputation of being super tech savvy, but um, that doesn't extend to text messaging necessarily. And I'm not sure why, and I'm not sure what the best way is to, uh, if you need to contact someone for an emergency court appearance and by court, I of course mean pickle ball court. Uh, what's the best way to do that? I don't know. I thought texting was pretty efficient. I thought everybody in 2023 pretty much abided by that, but it's not the case. So I don't know. Um, yeah. So that's my beef. I, I do appreciate all the generations, like Stolp said. I just want to get them out there. That's the hard part. Bruh, got to use Snapchat for real, for real. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's so true. All right, guys, time to get into the topic. And, and listeners, if you're just listening and you're not watching us on YouTube, um, we will be looking at some charts some graphics that we made and reviewing video footage so some elements of this may be tougher for some of you but we're going to try and put this together we're going to see what happens more than likely it is going to have a few elements of a train wreck in here as we are just doing this on the fly trying to bring you guys better content but that's what we're going to be doing today and as i said it's off ball movement court positioning uh, to, to add some context or maybe the underlying foundation to this, you have to be able to move on the court. You have to have good feet. You have to have athleticism. You have to be able to make the shots. A lot of the stuff we're going to be discussing has huge foundational elements that if you are a 3.0, a 3.5, maybe even a newly burgeoning 4.0, a lot of this may not be accessible to you quite yet because there are some big time skills that you have to be able to do at a high level already to be able to layer on top of the things that we're going to be discussing here. So I want to add that in there that, that this is a four or five plus conversation. This is good knowledge for everyone to have. But in order to execute some of these ideas well, you got to be a baller. And, and some people still are, are climbing up the, the, the skill ladder, which is perfectly OK. But the first thing uh, to, to discuss is off ball movement, your court positioning, what do you do when your partner is dropping or driving their thirds? Jesse, it is your birthday. I also know you've mentioned to us that you believe you've got the least to contribute to the topic. You're more interested in listening and learning, but I am going to pass it off to you to kick off the conversation. Yeah, I think that the best instruction I'll be able to give in this segment is um, how not to do off ball movement as you'll show in some of the videos. But um, to answer your question, uh, so I typically will will kind of wait and see. Uh, I think I move up more slowly than, than all of you do. Uh, I wait and see uh, the quality of my partner's shot, typically, uh, unless they uh, have demonstrated uh, a, a very high level of consistency. So I would wait for to see that, and then if I see it, you know they've hit say they've hit four quality drives in a row. I'm moving up then on that fifth one. I'm I'm running up. I'm not waiting, and I'm looking to poach. Excellent. Stop. Add your thoughts in here. What are you doing when we're driving or dropping thirds? As you're the off partner, remember this conversation is around you're not hitting the ball necessarily. You're the extra guy. You're off ball. But that is such an important part of the game. That doesn't. That does not compute to me. I am never off the ball. Just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, so I played with with Tim yesterday and was kind of thinking 
about some of this as as he was driving and dropping. Um, first of all, it, the off ball movement is so timed off of visual cues. So you play with your partner, you watch what they do, you see their consistency, you see what they're doing good, you see what they're they're not doing so good that day. Um, if I'm back with Tim and he's going to drop or drive, I'm I'm watching like Jesse said, waiting to see what he does. But the second I identify he's dropping, I know I know it's going to be a good drop. I'm taking two big steps and, and two small steps in to get up into that kitchen. And this is all a timing <clears throat> mechanism for me visually. And then and then with my own process to get up to the kitchen very, very quickly. Um, if he's driving, I won't take such exaggerated steps. I will take, so my visual cue is to see, wait for his, his paddle swing off of his, uh, off of the, when he reaches his apex on his back, backstroke, and then, and then take four quick choppy steps up because if it, if they hit it back or block it, I want to be there to attack in a, in a hands fight. So, um, at our level, I feel like everyone's pretty consistent and does these things very, very well, but my everything starts with a visual cue. Um, and I notice my visuals. Okay, there we go. I'm lagging a little bit, but, but, um, I, I, I liked what you had to say about auditory cues too, because you can, you can see with your eyes that my kids say this, you look with your eyes when we can't find something, but you hear with your, <clears throat> with your ears. And so, you know, your partner's what it sounds like when he hits a good shot. If it, if it, if it hits on the wrong part of the paddle and doesn't do what that person wants, you can adjust off of that. So visual audio cues, and then, and then knowing your own self and how, how you like to get up to the kitchen. Me, it's as fast as possible. Um, but I, I, I do, I do move pretty, pretty, um, uh, methodically, uh, with, with any one of my partners. Yeah. Tim is one of the best dudes I've ever seen in, in terms of putting pressure on an opponent's fourth shot, what what are you thinking? What are you doing when it comes to that third shot? Yeah, so if it's a drive, um, I'm pretty much kamikazing it up there, um, almost with the speed of the ball, and I'll just take my chances. If it's not a perfect drive, I'll just do my best up there. Uh, if it is a perfect drive, that bodes very well, obviously, but. Um, either way, I'm sprinting along with that ball. As soon as I see that it's a drive, especially yours, Ian, I'm, I'm, I played with you enough to know, um, to be in sync with that ball as it's traveling. Um, I just kind of know the speed that you hit with and, uh, at what point it leaves your paddle and, uh, what that ball looks like most of the time. If it's a drop, um, this is where I'm just really thankful that I have that, uh, I have those uh, short speed bursts because I can hang back a little bit and wait for that ball to travel about halfway across the court to know uh, how effective of a drop that is. And then, and then I just, I sprint up there as fast as I can to, to uh, get in behind it and take advantage. But if it's not a great drop, I'll just kind of hang back. But um, two very different scenarios for sure. But uh, um a lot of this is just kind of knowing your partner. It comes back to that a lot and knowing what kinds of balls they hit and having confidence in those kinds of shots um, and just kind of knowing what to expect and uh, being used to that. Yeah, also, I'm going to build on a lot of what was said. One, you absolutely must know your partner. Um, a lot of your core positioning, how you play, how you move, comes off of familiarity. If you're just doing a blind date at a tournament, you're going to struggle um, just cause you don't know what they're good at, what they, what they like to do, what looks like a quality shot. And then what Stolp was saying, watching things. I am a big believer in quickly determining what uh, to do based on what you're seeing your partner doing and whether it looks like a high drop or looks like it's too high of a drive. I can generally, I believe, make those determinations by the time the ball is passing through our kitchen, right? And so whether you're being aggressive, if I'm playing with a guy like Tim, I'm going to be super aggressive. Playing with a guy like Stolp, I'm going to actually be medium aggressive. If I'm playing with a guy like Jesse, I'm going to hang back because I don't want to create a chaotic situation in which he can't cover my baseline as effectively as, say, a Tim can. 
but and this is going to be something I'm going to harp on a lot in this episode, and that is how to make yourself a threat while you are not engaged with the ball. The ball is clearly not yours. And so when I see my partner, whether it's a third shot drive or a drop, my movement is simply closing down the windows of difficult shots my opponents can take. So let's use the example of Tim because we're playing the lead together. Um, and and there will be some uh, video clips of this. He'll take a great drive down the middle, and I will crash hard. And my my real purpose is not actually to try to get a closer on their fourth shot and hit a finishing fifth. Even though I'm I'm leaving that open for possibility, I'm up there to make sure that the ball that they deliver to Tim with their fourth shot is predictable. It's less aggressive because if I'm hanging back, they've got the full swath of the court, but Tim plays my left side. If he drives it straight up the middle and I'm pinching just off center of the tee, they're probably not going to come behind me because he's hit a drive that's difficult for them to control to go behind me. I'm also poised for a counterattack. So that gives about 40% of the court for them to actually play back to him. He can see everything. He can pro uh, probabilize where the ball is going to come and he can then work his way up. So being an off-ball threat, you can actually dictate uh, to a pretty significant degree what types of shots your opponents will be taking. So that's going to be something I'm going to re be repetitively harping on here. Um, but we got a lot to go through, so we're we'll just move on to the next question. What should you guys be doing when your partner is engaged in a dink battle, a prolonged dink battle, which you're being iced out, anti-targeted how are you playing that stop yeah so for me and and what i'm looking for in in the dink exchange that i'm not a part of is if it's if it's going cross court to my partner i'm i'm, I'm waiting for the opportunity to attack but i'm being smart um <clears throat> and so what i'm doing is i am shifting side to side synchronously with my partner so it is very important not to stay flat footed and still in those type of exchanges because you just you give the opponents too many gaps, too many options to work off of. If you are moving with your partner off the ball, the second that ball's popped up, one, you're ready and two, you're you're taking away potential winning shots for your opponent. So for me, it's just, it's just these um, lateral movements side to side, um, staying with them, but staying engaged mentally too. I think some of this off ball movement, you have to stay engaged, even though you're not uh, physically involved in the point in terms of hitting, hitting the ball over the net, you have to be ready in those 10, 20, 30 shot exchanges. I would say each shot that you get closer to 30 or 30 plus the pressure mounts. You do not want to let your partner down. I feel some of that tension. Sometimes points are lost because it's like, Oh my gosh, we've been doing this for the last five minutes. You have to stay mentally engaged. And part of mental engagement is off ball movement. So you always have a job to do. You always have somewhere to be and you should never find yourself stagnant in a point. Um, you do have a responsibility. So that's what I'm doing in dink battles. Awesome. Jesse, you often are the guy engaged in those prolonged think battles. But when you find yourself not engaged, and I, I know you like to be there, you're very confident there. But when you're off ball, how are you playing it? How are you thinking? Well, it, to be honest, it's a skill that, that needs some work in my game. Uh, it's something I'm working hard on now. Um, just since, since I played against you and Tim, I've been working on it. Um, so that was like, what, a week ago? Um, to do exactly what Stolp described, um, which which has not been, yeah, you know, it's been somewhat lacking in my game. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to be mentally alert. It's hard to to remember to move to the center when your um, when your opponent is drawn wide. And uh, you know, I've been playing for four years, and for most of that period, I felt very insecure about my backhand. So when I was on the left, I was sort of reluctant to move to the middle because I worried about somebody going behind me. Uh, 
and I lacked confidence that I'd be able to counter or block that shot. But now that I have a two-handed backhand, I, I have more confidence in my backhand, so I think I can be a little more aggressive shading to the middle. Hmm. Tim, go ahead. When your partner is engaged in a dink battle, how are you involved in yourself? I love how Stolt put it. Um, you just have to be moving constantly with the ball, with your partner. If he goes left, you go left. If he goes right, you go right. Um, and don't fall asleep over there. <laughs> be alert the entire time. Um, now for me, I, it's a little bit different from Stolp. I, I love that, man, I wish I were Stolp sometimes with that wingspan because he is looking to pounce at, at every opportunity at an, at an imperfect uh, dink. Um, he's going to reach in and do that patented Stolp volley reach, uh, reach in shot that everybody wishes they had uh, that seen it. For me, I am more, I'm just waiting to get my dink, but I have to be in the right position. Um, and the thing that I discovered, uh, very recently that, uh, actually somebody we're playing against Seth actually pointed out as the day wore on yesterday, as we were playing against Seth, it was, it was Stolp and I, he's like, Tim, I, I think I caught you. You were, uh, standing back a little bit off the kitchen line during those dink battles. And I'm like, yeah, I was. And the reason was, um, Seth has a lot of the same stuff that Stolp does. He's not as big, but he will reach in and attack a lot of those uh, weaker dinks. And he was getting us on those early and often yesterday. So what I was doing, if if I was off ball in a dink battle, I took a step back uh, behind the uh, kitchen line because really one of my only concerns in this scenario is being susceptible to being attacked. And most attacks are straight ahead. And he was uh, right across from me. He was thinking cross court with Stolp. And so he could speed up one of those at any minute. And he was catching me off of it. If you're back a little bit more on that, then you've got more time to react. You've got more time to survey the situation. You can even take a swing at it if it's not a great attack. And that's what we started doing. And it, it paid off instantly. So a lot of this is, I mean, even if you're not playing someone that, knows to attack it that well and has the uh, has that skill set like uh, Seth or Stolp does. I mean, it doesn't hurt you to give yourself some space, especially if you're off ball and play the percentages. Like, okay, if they attack this, um, if I'm back a little bit, and I'm not I'm not talking about like more than a foot. I mean, you know, that's it. Um, then you give yourself more of a chance, and you can actually be sort of aggressive with that. Uh, that response to an attack. If you're back that far and you have enough time to look at it, like every little, um, well, I'm not going to say inch, but like, I, I would say a foot like really makes a difference if you're back there and it gives you so much more response time. Because Tim, would you say taking that step back for you, you can adjust to everything in front of you. You can absolutely any, any dink that happens. If it's your dink, you're quick enough. You that, cause you're giving that space up. Um, so that you can respond to a speed up. So you're saying if you take a step back, you can do anything with a dink put in front of you, right? 100%. That is not a difficult ask at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I've noticed in women's doubles, we often see the women hanging back a little bit in dink battles. And I wonder if that's the, for the same reason to give them a little more reaction time. A lot of them use a two-handed backhand, which can take a little bit more time. Uh, but gives them more power. But you don't tend to see it in men's pro doubles. Hmm. You tend not to see it. But I did watch a video where they were. It was one of those, you know, coaching videos. And if Ben, like Ben Johns, if he thinks he sees his partner hitting a high dink, just like what Tim was saying, he will take one step backward, not like a crazy amount, but he will give himself just that extra window to evaluate. And if the dink comes back to him or goes back to his partner, he actually steps back in. So we're talking about on and off. Like you're literally moving, not just side to side, like Stolp's talking about, which is very important. Forward and back. Forward and backward. You can't be stationary. This is another thing that I think I'm super active off ball, particularly because I have counterattacks. I'm not an offensive guy. I'm always trying to move. This is why I love this conversation because Stolp's right. You have to move your feet but I actually don't move my feet as much as others. And then here, here's kind of the way I'm thinking about it. When Tim is on the left side in a backhand dink battle, I know where he's going to dink that ball most of the time. It's going to be farther across toward the alley, 
toward our opponent's left foot on the left side. So I've got to watch my alley. If he's going to be doing that over and over again, like he can do, I don't need to come to the middle every single time. I'm going to kind of camp it out there on my alley side. And if I'm right-handed with my counter attack ready, I'm going to try and put my left shoulder where the ball is landing, where he's landing the ball every time. If he then changes something up and maybe goes more towards the middle, then I will greatly shift myself and then put my left shoulder where he's bouncing that ball. So as a counter attacker, I'm looking where he's bouncing his dink and where they can attack me from that. So I'm actually finding the attack lanes that our opponents might have. I'm, I'm taking the probabilities. I'm guessing where could they be? And I'm placing myself in the line of fire. I'm saying, I dare you, come at me. Now that's not everyone will want to do that because they may not have the best counter punching. Like I said, you need to have a bunch of foundational skills to do this. But I will actually find myself and we'll watch it in the video. I'm much more patient and I'm not as, as active as Stolp is because I'm particularly trying to be in the spots that are attack lanes where I can be attacked. I'm trying to elicit that and be a threat. So I'm not trying to leave gaps. That's different. You're trying to fill those gaps. So know what your partner's doing. Evaluate whether it's a high dink. Don't just move side to side. Move forward and backward. Just that little space changes changes so much. Um, and then the last one before we get into our little charts and our, our videos, Jesse asked a good question in our Marco Polo group, and so we brought it here. How do you position yourself when your partner is prepping to strike an overhead. Tim, why don't you start here? Okay. So first of all, we need to clarify whose lobs are we talking about? That's a good point. <laughs> no, all right. We can talk about that sky lob that Seth has in a minute. We're talking about the normal lobs, a good lob that most people hit, not not the godlike things that Seth throws up. Okay. Yes. If this is a normal lob that you might see if you're not not facing Seth. That means it's it's not crazy high. Um, you definitely have the advantage in this scenario because most lobs are attackable, right? I mean, you don't let most lobs bounce, and you shouldn't because that's just a gift to your opponents. So if your partner is going back for an overhead, I'm treating that like a um, – oh, what do you call that? Oh, my gosh. My my mind is, is drawing a blank. We just talked about it. On the last episode. Shake and bake. That's, yeah, you're treating it like a shake and bake. I'm sorry. Yeah. You are charging the net if you're off ball because that's going to be a super hardly struck overhead. Um, perfect shake and bake ball. Perfect in most uh, most cases. Um, now, it does matter who's hitting that overhead. Not everybody has a ferocious overhead. Um, and I definitely take that into account. If, if my partner does not have a a menacing overhead, I'm going to hang back a little bit, I think, because I don't find that those are particularly hard to deal with. Also depends a little bit on where your opponents are. Um, if they're hanging back and they, they probably are um, on a lob, unless the lob was so good that they, they ran in behind it and now they're taking charge of the kitchen area. But um, in most cases I'm crashing the net as if it's a uh, shake and bake. Yeah. So when I am off ball and my partner's prepping for an overhead, I'm, and, and the, the idea, where it's not like super tackable. It's not a short ball where we can both stay at the kitchen. It's a good lob, but you can still get a paddle on it. I, and because I'm a right side player, I, I'm, I'm kind of weird. I, once I know my partner is going to on the left side step in with their forehand, I'm going to clear off the court. Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to run at onto my alley and maybe even out of bounds so that my partner can position themselves, have the full court to stand where they want to stand. After I believe they have established their footwork, I know how they want to take it, they've got all the time to line up, I will actually come back in on the shake and bake scenario that Tim is talking about, tracking them. So I will clear out hard give them complete total control of the court. And then I will move back in based on what I think they're going to do. Tim, did you have something to add? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, 
I forgot about the uh, clearing out part of it, but for sure, you don't want to run in too fast. You don't want to be, we talked about somebody that runs in super fast off of thirds um, and how they're, they're kind of in the way sometimes. It's not just this one person, but um, especially on an overhead, you want to hang back until that ball is struck because you want to give your partner as much clear space as possible to hit that shot. Um, you don't want to confuse him and have you be in the corner of his eye as he's taking that overhead. Yep. So get out of yes, the way. Just get out, get of, the out way. of the way. Absolutely right. Yeah. Let's go. Go ahead. Yeah. So for me, my getting out of the way, if I'm up at, at, at the net and my partner is getting ready to take an overhead, you know what I'll do? Cause I'm such a big target. Getting out of the way is more distracting for, for my partner and sometimes I'll just duck and like really get small and try and get small to give those same options, Ian, as you, you described, but in a non-distracting way. I think off ball movement and, and some of the additions I'll add to this conversation is just my size imposes decisions on, on my opponents, whether I'm, on a, you, I'm hitting the, the shot or not it can be the same distracting manner for my partner. So if my partner's going for an overhead and it's deep and it's going to be taken out of the air and I'm at the kitchen, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting small. Um, now if it's, if it's no, cause the only time I'm really not taking the overhead, I'll take 75% of the court. Every time my partner's like, you, you take it, you go, you go, you go, and I'll take it. So, so as the alpha big, big overhead guy, that's my responsibility. If it's if it's going to be a good lob, that is for sure my partner's. I'll if it's if it's back a lip in the mid court area, I'll retreat with it and watch what his shot's going to do. Um, and but but really, I I like to stay unless it's a really great lob close to the kitchen. Get small, get out of the way. Awesome. Yeah, I, I have something to add. So for for overhead slams, whether it whether you've been lobbed or it's a pop up, as a beta player. I, I find that body language is important, and so it's not enough just to say you. As the beta, you want to actually move away from that ball to make it clear with your body that you're not taking it, and that, that gives your alpha uh, the absolute clarity that he needs to, to take that ball. Awesome, awesome. Um, all right, so we're going to move along because we got a lot to cover. Stolp, I'm going to talk about, real quick, Dinking cross court, and then I want you to be thinking about your Ernie's. You want to add yep. in faking Ernie's and whatnot. Now, this is on ball movement, but this is very important court positioning that I've noticed recently people struggle doing. If you are in a cross court dink battle, you're the one engaged in it, and you are hitting an aggressive cross court dink. You are, and we've, we've talked about this many times. We're finally going to go over the chart of it. The Louis rule comes into effect. You hit an aggressive cross court dink to your partner's alley. They have to cover that. You need to follow your dink on a cross court. You cannot just park it out wide. If you're hitting cross court, I think you're obliged to take one, two, maybe even three steps, depending on your size, right? Stolp and I take different steps to get into position. But you need to follow your cross-court dink because you're telling your, your partner, hey, if I'm going to cross-court it to the alley, I'm telling them where they need to cover. And so you need to then back them up and cover their middle. If it comes aggressively at you, you better have the wheels to get back outside. And if you don't have the wheels to go hard corner to corner and cover the middle in between everything – then maybe you shouldn't be doing such hard cross-court dinks. Maybe you need to lay balls more into the middle, right? Jesse, I've noticed this is something that, that really frustrates me that you do well, is you will not deep outside corner cross-court dink with me. You will put it right kind of at my center body or at my left foot on my backhand. You're just like, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to keep everything more centralized in the middle of the court. You take away all my angles. You take away all the aggression I can create. So when you are dinking, be smart about the shots you're taking based on how much court you can cover. But when you are aggressive, you need to shadow your ball, follow your ball. It's the polite thing to do if you're going to expose your partner and put them on the chopping block. I, I generally agree with that advice, and I need to do a better job of following it. 
But I also think that it depends on the player, too, because, you know, there are certain players like you, Ian, Banu, Jeff Ma, that have this hard-angled forehand topspin roll. And you like that shot, and you don't attack up the middle that often, but you do like to do that topspin roll. And um, if I'm moving towards the middle every time, it really opens up. Like if we're going right to right, so we're going forehand to forehand, and if I'm moving to the middle, it really opens me up for that shot. Mm -hmm. So I want to be ready to quickly scramble to the right and do an ATP when you hit that shot. Absolutely. No, that, that is that's sound advice, but that's one, knowing your opponent, and knowing what you you don't give me opportunities to do that very often um and that's why you want to play the middle but but that's absolutely right you got to know what's going to be coming back at you stole you had a lot of thoughts about ernie's and how to use that court positioning yeah i think off court ball movement to fake ernie is a very um powerful tactic if you can deploy the timing correctly correctly it does depend on your timing because if you're too early and meaning moving into an Ernie position in a dink battle, you give the the, the cross court dinker opponent an opportunity to body bag you or or leave open far far too much space um, in the middle and and not towards the alley, but on on that on that uh, side that you're earning on. So it does depend on timing. However, if I like, let's use it the four of us on our squares as Ian and Jesse, our partners, Stolp and Tim, because I'm on the left here in my box. Um, if Tim is cross court dinking his forehand uh, to Ian's forehand and he puts something angular on the line where Ian has to, to, to look down and make a decision quick, I'm going to jump the kitchen corner, position myself and make sure he sees me position myself in an earning position that means he has one shot he can do in my mind and that is to put a good dink back to tim it eliminates his options he cannot he cannot get it in time to, to put it in front of me and if he does guess what i'm there to smack it down for an ernie but then tim in theory should be able to to loosen up and then and then cover more towards the middle if it's not a perfect you know again uh, to the alley cross court. Team. It's hard for me to be aggressive it's, with that. It's ball. hard for you to be aggressive with that. So he can pinch towards the middle and hopefully you, Ian would leave the ball up and allow him to attack when done correctly. And I put pressure on the opponent with a fake Ernie or an Ernie off ball movement. Tim can finish this. It, it, it shortens the, the lifespan of points. I've seen it done right now. The opposite of that. What happens if I get there early or what if I get there late? It just creates gaps, things you do not want to do. If you're there early, I mentioned before, there's a gap and then there's your body that that gives gives Ian that opportunity to hit me. If I'm there late, there's a huge there's a huge lane in front of him that he can make a decision with his forehand to speed up, even off of the bounce if it's not a perfect. And your so, partner doesn't know you're going, so they don't have time to shift. T Tim has expressed in the past like, hey, I see what you're doing. And yes, it's effective. However, it kind of exposes me. It makes me, it takes away, where should I be? Should I be in the middle? Should I cover my my um, alley? I it, it does. It puts question marks and you never want to do that. So it is predicated on timing, but when executed correctly, I can argue it is so imposing. I've never seen a non-shot affect an opponent shot more than an off-ball Ernie movement. Well, I remember and yesterday you did, that, you did that to me. And it, your timing was perfect. Right when I went to go strike it, you jumped the corner. And even though I wasn't trying to go where you were, knowing that, oh, crap, the threat is now expanded, I missed the dink right into the tape. Just It, it just throws you off a little bit. And you're an elite-level dinker. So so if someone who is not an elite-level dinker, but maybe you know four or five plus has great skill sets, but maybe dinking is a, low, a lower priority to them, you can do this, influence shots, win points, um, and I've seen it work. And you, you just—it's all about taking options away, right? If your if your opponents have less options, the less chance they are to score points. And so that's what I'm constantly putting pressure on with off-ball Ernie movement. Excellent. Any uh, final comments before we jump into our little graphics here? All right, Jesse, why don't you pull up my screen? So 
we're, 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 we're building this plane as we're flying it, people. But here uh, is how I want to do it. I want to discuss and talk about the, the mess I've thrown on here and then have you guys respond it. So these are the two scenarios of the shake and bake with the right side and left side players taking the drive in this one over here. This is going to be uh, the left side player who's taking this. And as you can see, they're driving up the middle. This is the right side player. And I've got these yellow arrows. They are taking this sweeping motion here to get out of the way of the ball flight of of the striker, of the third shot driver. But then they're ready to streak across here. We've got the only attack lanes that the opponents can use uh, if if the ball is too high or where those gaps are, especially with this guy streaking. So it's incumbent upon the guy in the back to be able to visualize and cue in deep here. Um, and, and then the same thing over here on the right side. We got him driving it. Generally speaking, it's probably going to be driven on his side of the court. It can come over here, and that just changes the loop that the left side player will use. But again, take a sweeping motion, get out of the visual lane of your opponents, and be ready to streak across here. And these are the only gaps that the guy in the back uh, has. So this is what we mean when visually speaking, for you visual learners, this is what we're talking about with the shake and bake. Um, Tim, Stolp, Jesse, you have any thoughts on additions here that this is queuing into you? I guess not. We will move on to. I'm looking Aaron. at all the. I'm looking at all the arrows and trying to uh, like play play this in my mind. And so the way you explain it's perfect. It is, and and I can actually feel and visualize it happening in real time. So that's that is actually perfect stuff. But just for those, so so red indicates drive, yellow indicates off ball movement in these arrow settings. Yes. Yep. I've I'm never not... I've never actually heard anybody suggest moving up with that curve oh really yeah so that's like like is that a pickle bros exclusive it must be that is how i handle it every single time i loop because i want to create space for my partner to take because you know guys how i've complained in the past of um guys will like like mcgregor he will get up so fast he actually cuts off a huge amount of the court that i want to be able to use this is my, my way of avoiding it. I try and follow the flight path, the wake of the ball, and I get out of the way, get out of the visual spectrum of my partner to get, help them as best I can succeed. Ian, I've actually heard you coach this to your partners in when, when they do just take straight lines in. So the, 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 the curvature approach, Ian, I've, I've heard you instruct people. And it makes sense. Like you don't take away my options because then you eliminate the opportunity to do and things then like this. You think about it too, say, say these guys are trying to look at things. He is, if you're, if his visual spectrum is like here and you're out of that, and then all of a sudden you flash inside, Yes. That's kind of what Jared does. Jared remains out of your sight of view with the Singaporean slasher. And then he comes into view. And it is so disruptive because you're not tracking him peripherally, especially because most people are right-eyed. Now, I'm left-eyed, which is why I like the right side of the court. I can see more. But if this is a right-eyed person, they are not going to see you coming around on the outside here. That's a good point. All, all of their visual is going to be in this spectrum of the court. So you can actually stay out of their view, stay out of your partner's view, and you can still evaluate everything that's going on. So that arky motion of the yellow um, arrow is what stood out to me too. Is that really how you how you move, Ian? Uh, that's how I think I move. Whether okay. I actually have a rainbow parabola, um, <laughs> we can watch on some tape. But that's okay. what I think in my mind's eye. That's what I'm performing. So. Because I think specifically the the uh, movement that you want to do, I agree with the uh, concept behind it. Stay out of your partner's uh, vision, um, but I would definitely I'd shuffle over it in a straight line and then move forward in a straight line along that same. Um, so if you're on the trajectory, left side, you would prefer to come in more like this. Yeah, I just wouldn't move like an arky mm. um, uh, direction. 
I would move in straight lines. That's okay. all. Okay. But you'd probably hang back so he has his options. It, it, this is this is. It's all about creating spacing for your partner to hit the shot that they mm -hmm. want. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. <laughs> that looks like a T-shirt that you've created in the past. This is <laughs> so our brains <laughs> on on display. Exactly. This is funny. All right, Ernie's Stolp. This is what you were talking about. This guy right here is is Stolp, right? Hanging out, left side player on the outside, and we're gonna assume that the ball is a well played ball. It's not too high. It's a good unattackable dink. Maybe has some spin, tight angle, and Stolp has come outside. <clears throat> like you said, he's timed it well. He's come outside, so that red arrow is his threat matrix his threat area <clears throat> excuse me your response you have two options as the off ball guy you can retreat back and give yourself some more space as tim was mentioning earlier or you can stay up at the line and be aggressive and know that your fast hands are going to matter but this yellow line is the huge swath of court coverage that you have required now if you look at the square footage of the guy who's retreated you have way more time, way more space to cover things, but you generally are not going to be able to be aggressive over here with option one. Option two, you can be aggressive, but it's a tighter uh, it's a tighter window, shorter time frame. And then the highlighted portion over here, these triangles, are the space that you're leaving vulnerable, but probably will not be aggressively attacked. So if the ball gets over here, into these highlighted areas, you're gonna have to move your feet quickly, come over and probably hit a nice lift dink somewhere over in this area to allow your earning guy to come back and establish himself in the middle of the court. That's really cool. Um, I will tell you right off the bat, uh, looking at that, I love option two uh, for its aggressiveness. <laughs> I 100% of the time end up doing option one because I don't speak Ernie. So yeah. I'm never on the same page as my Ernieing partner. If I knew um, the instances in which he was going to attempt the Ernie, I would move right up there with him and cut that off and be super aggressive as the off ball mover. But since I, I just don't, I don't operate that way. I just react. I'm like, oh, well, I hope he gets this Ernie. If not, I'll just hang back here and clean up, you know, whatever they get back. We have excellent video footage of what you're talking about right now. So so bring this back. That's good stuff. Roll the tape. Roll, oh, right. oh, oh, it's not tape yet. No, no, okay. not quite yet. Um, this right. is covering the middle. Uh, I, I got these examples because of all the, of the many videos we're going to watch, we're going to 11 or 12 videos. The middle coverage is the single most exposed point um, for Jesse and Mick. <clears throat> and it's not this zone right here. Purple is where guys like Tim really like to attack. And whether it's a third shot drive or you're at the kitchen, you have to close these gaps down. Perhaps you leave your lanes on the outside exposed, but if the ball's in the middle of the court, hitting that shot is very challenging. And so you want to be holding your middle. This guy right here is protecting the guy who's coming up off the return, right? So maybe bad return. Maybe the guy is just excellent drivers. He's on his way up. I would stay about right here. You get your forehand on this side. You're athletic enough to cover here. But if the ball's kind of on this side of the court, it's coming this way. It's coming to attack the guy who's lagging. You have to cover that middle aggressively. And if you're in a dink battle and you get a dead dink, both guys need to pinch middle here. You need to, because attacking this way or attacking this way is so hard to do well. Because if you hit that with any pace, you're going to be out of bounds. Maybe you can hit it with some super aggressive top spin with some arc, but most four or five players are going to be able to step out wide and take that as a reset or a lift dink. You got to protect the middle here. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts before we move on? And these are all graphics that you know we've all discussed, and that they're here because you guys have been mentioning it to me. This is lob positioning. Look, this guy has cleared off the court. He's just run off the court completely. Or another option, 
is to run backwards. Just get out of the frame of view of your partner who is looking to strike that overhead. Now, both guys on the baseline, on the opposite side, have retreated to the baseline because this is a good lob that is still going to get smashed the crap out of, right? So this is a Tim. This is a Stolp. They're going to do something with this ball. What do you do as this dude right here? Get out of the way. Because as soon as they strike this ball, then you can come back in and flash for your shake and bake and get aggressive. But give them time to do what they need to do. Yeah, and the ball striker in that situation, too, is going to follow his shot and be up in the kitchen with you. If you retreat and then go forward after the ball's um, struck, you're going to do the same thing. That's a, that's a great diagram. Awesome. And then the one thing we probably bring up the most because it's the most neglected, and I think the single most important cognitive rule for a 4-5 player to really establish themselves as a solid 4-5 is the Louis rule. So you have to shade the ball. In this instance, the ball's on the left side of the court. Over here, the ball's on the right side of the court. This dude right here, this yellow space, just extend it back. That's his responsibility. That and that alone. This guy over here, it's the same thing. He has nothing else to worry about except this lane, protecting his body and protecting the alley. And again, we're assuming that this ball is not high. It's not attackable. It's a well-struck cross-court dink, perhaps. You have to come over, and this red space is what you cover as the guy covering the middle. This is where that purple ball is going to go. Jesse, you are going to see this a lot with you and Mick. This is where Tim kept attacking you guys. This is the most important lane to cover here because anyone's going to know they're not going to come up the alley. If you're really dedicated and have a good counter punch, you're not going to get attacked on the alley here. But if this red guy does not, if this guy with the red arrows does not come over, that purple lane is going to be attacked. Now, again, the highlight over here is the exposed area of the court. Almost certainly not going to be able to be attacked aggressively. Most guys will be able to get the ball over there but not in a manner that you can't cover. So just shift your feet, come back over, and the play actually resets at that point. What happens is this guy now comes here and you come here, or this guy has to shift over now and you come here. That's how you adhere to the Louis rule when these hard, aggressive cross-court scenarios uh, occur. That's awesome. Wow. Awesome. This is like pickleball university. Like I see, like, like seriously, this is a, this is a university level pickleball class that I'm, awesome. I'm witnessing. All right. Time to get into the clips. Any, any final commentary there? We, um, need, we need to be charging for this content. I was going to yeah. say, are we really providing this for free? What's wrong with us? It's because <laughs> we love you listeners. We love our fans. All right, Jess, go ahead and bring this up. Um, and I've got my notes here. This is good on everybody. So check this out. I love the movement from everybody here. <laughs> See that shifting? Look at mm -hmm. that. Thing of beauty. And watch Tim shifts over. Watch the middle, Jess. Here it comes. Yep. So we'll watch it just one more time. See, Tim's hanging back. Tim moves back to give himself time. Yeah. Wasn't sure if my drop was going to be good. We, now we're up. We're close. It's the dink battle. Shifting. I just love this as a good example. Ugh. I love movement. It's so I'm fun watching to talk about. Tim the second he takes that step back. Watch and, and Mick or Mick hits a dead ball or it's Jesse. It's dead, it's high, he attacks it. Did you see his right foot plant first? That's that is such a good indicator of the middles coming. Gosh, yep. that's great. Clip. Absolutely. Yeah, I gotta do something about that. It's no, tell. no. Thanks for the video, Ian. In this, my particular off ball threat is what I'd like people to pay attention to. In the we'll black shirt. It, we'll, yeah, we'll watch it a couple times. So watch how I'm pinching the middle, and I'm forcing them to give Tim a very predictable ball. Yep. Look where your feet are. 
and then it's just a lift ink. Mick goes for a heavy cross court. I do the same. It's a little high. I'm able to attack Jesse and put it away. One more time. Watch how I'm making them give Tim a deliberate, predictable ball. Sweet. And Jesse just fell victim to my superpower of uh, <laughs> of uh, backhand. That's all that was, Jess. So good on you. All right. Screw, screw your superpowers. We, right. we all need t-shirts, first of all, with our superpowers on it. Yes. Let's work on that for uh, Christmas. Okay. Yeah, find, find a superpower. Here we go. <laughs> going to reload. It's your brain. Yeah, your mega mind, dude. Uh, and in this one, this is bad Louie rule from both me and Jesse. Watch how we do not move, and it's really bad. Oh, sorry, I had the wrong clip. That's Tim's bad Louie rule. Tim gets, Tim gets Wait beat. a minute, what did I do? Let's see. Watch, Je watch, watch Jesse beat you on your alley. All right. Oh my gosh. That's now, bad. Now, Jesse, to his credit, hides this very well. But you're not protecting your lane. Um, yeah, no, I'm not. Oh, yeah, and you sold out in the middle. It just struck me as a tough shot to hit. Like, I dared him. It is. But you're right, you're right. At, when you're playing at the 4 5 level, guys can hit this shot. I was so irritated. Dude, you totally shaded towards the middle. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Can I just say thank you for showing a shot where I actually did something good? <laughs> it is right? your birthday. <laughs> it's immortalized. Oh, it is because it's your birthday. That's so funny. All right. This, I believe this is the bad Louis rule on both sides. Neither Jesse or I move. Watch us at the end of this point. Now, Jesse loses, so Jesse loses the point because he doesn't move, but I'm also not helping Tim at all if that ball comes back. Yeah. <laughs> See how big that gap is on both sides? It's just not the thing, good. Court. The thing is, I know that Tim has this shot. He does it all the time, and yet I guess I just forgot to defend against it. Ian, how I interpret that for you is that's just a lot of trust. You, you know that that's gonna, trust. You're just going to be, you know that's getting put away. I do, but at it's the very same flattering. time, I'd like to still play the game the right way, you know? <laughs> One last time. Oh, Jesse. <laughs> Did you see that front right foot? Did you see Tim's uh, right foot? That's that's going to be my cue, looking for the middle now. Same thing on the one-hander or the two-hander, I guess. Yeah. I, I have to say there's no better way to improve your pickleball than have your mistakes uh, broadcast to our, you know, to the entire planet. <laughs> your, your, your embarrassing mistakes. Happy birthday, Jesse. Yeah. Happy birthday, dude. We showed All a good right. one of you. That should be enough. <laughs> you got another one here? Yeah, we got, we got several more. Um, we can't nasty Nelson you, so we have to do this. Right. Uh, Jesse, sorry again, brother. You're late on the Louis roll here. Mm. Yeah. You really have to shade. And you don't even have to be the one to get that ball. You just have to tell Tim that there's not a gap there. That's all that, that's really required in that instance. Yeah. All right, bringing up the next one. Um, I'm going to be the greatest practitioner of the Louis rule you guys have ever seen going forward. I love <laughs> it. Um, Jesse, this is good on you. I want you guys to watch this from the lens that I am trying. I'm on the left side this time. I'm trying to attack up the alley. And Jesse's not allowing me to do it. Watch from that lens. It's actually really interesting. Shifted my feet. I want to go up the middle. Nope. I want to go. Nope. I hang tight. If you guys can. Now Mick just misses the dink. But if you guys watch the hesitation in my body. 
That's me trying to look and see if Jesse's going to give me that spot, and he's not doing it. So good stuff, Jess. Good example. It was good just example. a few of tiny little steps. I guess that was enough. It, 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 it doesn't take much. I just need to not know because it's all probabilities. Just need to know whether it's there or not. Um, all right. We have, I do not come over to help Tim. This is bad Ian. See how late I am and I force him into a bad shot. Had I been tracking with him, I think it would have been uh, much more calm. So for those listening, the, this we would all encourage you to go over to the YouTube channel and check it out because we're watching these videos in real time, analyzing and then dissecting. Um, and there's a lot of stuff going on. And this is great content. I love what we're seeing. Um, it's it's just this is I, I love how you put it. We're flying the plane as we what did you say? Building it as we're flying. I'm gonna, I'm gonna find a different way to show you. I I didn't know that I couldn't the tabs would be different it's, ones every time. It's so. I think it's a beautiful incorporation to some high level pickleball that we're talking about with some real life examples. It's it's it it's so awesome. All right, so this is uh, some middle coverage mistakes here. We've got a few of these in a row. It's really important to see how, how important the middle is here. Right there. Mm. Not pinching the middle. And Tim, you hit that actually kind of light. It just was a little high. Yeah. It's just because that gap for you was just so big. Yeah. And this angle of the camera, it's difficult to actually see. How There's much, a big hole there. How how big that hole is, yeah, because we're sitting at an angle. Um, on this next one, it is another middle error scenario. Moving people around. Nick doing a good job with the off-ball movement, I see. See how Jesse doesn't come, probably should be stepping on the white line. And again, from this angle, you can't quite see how big that gap is, but Tim can hit it so hard and keep it so low that that's just enough for him. Dead dink, boom, he attacks it. <clears throat> All right. We will skip another middle miss and move on to... Uh, another, which is Tim doesn't give them a chance to go to the middle. This is a really good example of some pressure that you can create uh, just by your court positioning. Now, I think I catch the net here. <clears throat> Not this one. Yeah, see, this is the Ernie conversation. Tim's holding that middle line, forcing them to come to me, but he's got it covered. Look where, watch where Tim's feet are. He's standing on that white line. Now he's also backed himself up, as he's mentioned. Yep. Mm -hmm. He's given himself that extra time. But because my Ernie threat is very real, it really limits the options that Jesse has here. And I can still be offensive from back there. <clears throat> yep. The only thing that could have made it better for Jesse was his reset could have been a little bit lower and more difficult to attack. Um, on to the next, we got three left. This is Ian, Tim and I pinch middle here. So watch how important I know where Tim has been playing the ball. This is later in the match. Watch how close Tim and I are standing next to each other on this. <clears throat> and then I'm just able to put it away because there's absolutely no gaps at all to pass. Most people can't actually play that close to each other, but Tim and I have developed some good rapport, and I, and we know what our swing strokes are. By the way, that was a great get, Ian, because he hit it up to your left shoulder. It's a pretty awkward spot. Yeah, it's a little half scorpion kind of kind of lean yeah. thing. Yeah. All right, on to the next. We got two more, this and one more. Um, Tim is – this is off-ball threat play. Tim is creating 
a threat based on where he stands. Now, on this one, I do clip the net, which makes it difficult for Mick. But but don't avoid the luck or avoid trying to pay attention to the luck I had. Watch Tim's court positioning. Mick has to come back at me for a put away just because of where Tim is standing. He's got no other options because Tim's threat is so prevalent there in the middle. Tim is completely, when you say forsaking his left side, he's fast enough to get there, but he really wants this ball to stay on the right side of the court. He doesn't touch it, but I deliberately get, I, I think this is Tim's put away based on his movement. And our final video is back to back. Okay, so Tim and I look like heroes here, but this is a shaken, <laughs> shake and bake example. Well, by the way, Tim and I won this match against Jesse and Mick. It was a competitive match, but we were in control um, the entire time, which is Mick actually did an analysis of it. Tim, you haven't heard this, so I'll, I'll, I'll add this in before we watch this final video. Jesse had uh, zero unforced errors in both games mick had or, or in, in one of the games mick only had four you had uh 11 oh yeah that sounds about right and i had 10 but jesse also had zero winners and mick only had four winners you had 12 winners and I had 13 winners. Wow. So you and I were making a lot more mistakes, but we were in control <laughs> because we had way more winners. So on this one, this is the shake and bake. It's a great – I put this in here because Tim and I each do it to each other back to back. And let's see if I actually approach the line the way I think I do. Tim's are just sitting up there. Mick delivers the ball back. The serve's coming back to me. Tim's going to get the ball. And I put it away. Oof. So again, watch Tim's approaching the net. Puts it away. Jesse's, Jesse's block was a little high, but I hit a good drop. Or I hit a good drive. And then this is me coming in. The loop. And that one was better, Jess. I just flashed across. So one more time. This is both guys being aggressive. Now Tim comes out of it linearly. I do think I have a bit of a of a an arc in my path here. Yeah, you do. Interesting. Yeah, yep. I wouldn't think that that uh, that would be too efficient, but you get there. Yep. All right. <clears throat> After watching all those videos, sorry, I dominated the airtime there. Um, but uh, any thoughts, guys? Got any final comments to add here? I just want to encourage everyone to go look at these videos because they describe really well exactly what we've been talking about this whole hour. Um, and Stolp's right. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to explain these things. Uh, that's why that we were, that's why we were very insistent on having the visual aids because it's so much easier to explain if you can see uh, what we're talking about with the uh, those four figures are all facing the same direction or the videos, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's uh, really good stuff. So I encourage people to go uh, take a look. And you know, I think it gives listeners and viewers an insight to, to our conversations, our daily conversations. And, and the fact that we have this podcast to be sharing all of this is, is outstanding because we talk about this and, and, and are really, really passionate about it, as you can see. But to have a visual representation really allows us to describe to a larger audience what we're talking about. So if you feel um, like it was a little confusing or overwhelming, it, we this is this is our this is our brains on display, like I said earlier. But this is really high quality stuff that you can learn from, um, and especially the the imposing nature of off ball movement that it can allow you to win points. I think it was so cool to see that because that's a hard description you, to, to describe that. It's difficult, but to see it in action, you can put yourself in that position and say, oh, yeah, I've done that. Or, oh, yeah, I've seen that. I've, I can do that. So that's the importance of some of these visual aids. And, and uh, thanks for, for, for sticking around and doing this with us. Jesse, final point. word. Yeah, you know, if you're if you're listening to this and watching it and your eyes are kind of glazing over and you're like, yeah, yeah, shading, yeah, yeah, Louis rule. That was me up until like a week ago. 
And it's one thing to kind of understand it intellectually, and it's another to actually implement it in a game. It's, it's much it. harder to do the latter, to know in the middle of the heat of battle, I, uh, my partner's been pulled wide, I need to cover the middle. Mm -hmm. And um, I would encourage our listeners to videotape themselves and see if, you're, if you are following the advice that uh, you've heard in this episode. Yeah, a million percent. Because Jesse, one thing about you is you make adaptations and additions to your game, I think, better than just about anyone I know. So you having finally seen what it looks like, you know what your opponents are seeing, I, I'm very confident that these changes are going to be implemented effectively and quickly. So yes, film yourself. It is it is such an underrated and under-talked about part of improving. So, But Pickleballers, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Pick Bros Podcast. Thank you for joining us uh, on, on, the, on the plane trip while we were building the plane. Uh, like the video, share it around, film yourself, film yourself. We love you all. Stay safe and stay out of the kitchen. <laughs>